Welcome back, everybody. It is episode 29 of the More Doors podcast. Today, we are going to do a GP profile on our one and only co-host and co-founder, Brian Force. Hot seat. We're going to come back to you with all that greatness right after this. Okay, everybody, welcome back to episode 29. We're super excited today. Our episode two of our three-part GP profile series today featuring the one and only Brian Force. But before we get to that, we need to give a big nod to our sponsors. We continue to get amazing support from the one and only Jesse at Tor Studios. Go check Jesse out at torestudios.com. You want to publish a great podcast and get some excellent support, a lot of creativity, go contact Jesse. Tell him we sent you and tell him he's got the best beard ever and he might just give you a little bit of a discount. Mm -hmm. Also want to give a big shout out to the one and only team at Deep Blue Capital. Go check us out at deepbluere.com. Uh, we just made some big announcements yesterday to our investors, and we are on schedule and on pace to deliver our year one returns, which in this market I think is uh, a great testament to all yes. the work that happens behind the scenes. We're going to continue to work hard to deliver, and we have a robust pipeline. Is robust? Mm, that's a, a perfect. Yeah. You like that? Yeah. Okay, so we have a robust pipeline of opportunities. and <laughs> Go subscribe to the newsletter. Follow us on Facebook. Follow us on LinkedIn and Instagram. Stay in touch with us because we've got a lot of great stuff coming up. And honestly, if you haven't checked out uh, some of the past episodes, we have some amazing guests. Um, go check those out as well. Yeah. How you doing, boys? That was great. Good. By the way, I like Matt doing the intro. I'm He's done. I'm probably retired. The, the best, yes. I think. Yeah. He doesn't think he is. He's so full of shit. Is. No, I love it. Oh, really? No, for sure. Mm. And you're using the word robust. You definitely went to AI and was like, all right, give me some words that I can add to 2020. Yeah. How do I make myself sound smarter? Yes. Dot com. Gonna be. <laughs> <laughs> you imagine, like, what is it, Neuralink? Is the yeah, and when you have Neuralink and then they they add some AI to it and you just like talk like a really high like you have a massive vocabulary all of a sudden, and everybody's just walking around like just using insane words and faculty with language. It's not that far off, guys. Um, you just said faculty, so yes. yeah, I think that 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 even trumps robust. I spent yeah. a lot of money on a creative writing degree though, so I get I got a couple. Yeah. Okay. I got a couple. You got a bank. couple. Yeah. Nice. You know what I will say? Brian has spent a lot of money on that creative writing degree. And if you go to deepbluere.com and sign up for a newsletter, spot any spelling errors or any missed words, <laughs> and uh, we will give you a $50 deal. There you go. Seriously. Actually, we can't give you that because there's probably – we'll bankrupt the company. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We'll go under. It's a writing degree and not a spelling degree, boys. <laughs> there's a difference. Dude, they didn't teach how to use spell check or Grammarly or anything I, in that dude, course? Dude, you'd, you'd be amazed at what gets past spell check. I put application with like four Ps the other day, and it didn't even flag it, and I had to go back and reread it. That's because you thought it was spelt right, so you made it correct on yeah, that. And I was like, oh, like, that is how it's <laughs> I've trained my computer to have terrible spelling like oh, me. Oh, man. Uh, good stuff. Nick, welcome back, bro. Thank you. We man, missed you. Man, I was deathly ill for two weeks. Yeah. Whatever was going around, look, it's an election year, so I'm assuming they released some new virus out there. Version four. Because I got tested with everything, and it all came back negative, um, which is my personality anyway. So it was, probably, it was probably positive. They're like, you're just negative. <laughs> Grumpy. Or, yeah. <laughs> like, well, you're right. So, no, like last week I was pissed because I wanted to be on there. I was like, all right, I'm not. I didn't even text. I didn't even show up. Yeah. Like last week's show. I was well, Brian so, pretended that you did. Oh, I did not yeah, text. No, he, was I, like, he was like, yeah, Nick said he's not coming. Maybe I said it the day before. because I, like, I just kind of figured. Because I, I, I talked to you the day before and I was like. Yeah, yeah you, you should have seen my eyes. look like I'd hit a massive bong or something. It was red and God, it was awful. And I don't even do any of that stuff. Really? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we'll find. This out. is not a GP profile on me. Stop talking about. <laughs> you can go listen to the last episodes on that one. True, that was a good episode yeah, too. There was you. a lot of really good nuggets. Yeah, today is Brian's in the hot seat. So he is Brian Force. Yeah, fire away, boys. Tell us about how what you would do for a hundred thousand. <laughs> <laughs> That's another show. That yeah. was That's years the ago. Show. I said. <laughs> 
That's the that's the other show, yeah. guys. No, come on. I, I do want. I'm excited to hear the deep dive on this one, just because you know, you and I go way back, Brian. Mm-hmm. But just to hear the story, you know, growing up and and how you you know you got into real estate mm-hmm. and then. Um, you know, the success that you had and then just how you've parlayed that into the investment world. So, you know, one, because we've not really done this, give us who is Brian Force? Yeah. Mm. Well, thanks, boys. I'm excited to, to be in the hot seat. Um, yeah, I grew up in a military family. Uh, father's a, a, a combat veteran. And uh, we we were... Yeah, I grew up in a in an environment where, from an early age, and if I have children of my own someday, I, I hope to be this type of parent that, you know, we were we were never hurting for anything, but it was very instilled in me from a young age that that you get what you earn, and uh, that stuck with me, you know, my entire life. We my my father um, left the Air Force, became an airline pilot. Uh, we moved to a nice city in Texas, and. Uh, had very, you know, a very affluent city where, you know, most of the the population was was at a whole different level. Uh, and so I had a lot of influence from like very wealthy people in my circle from when I was like a young kid and uh, grew up, I should say, you know, for lack of better or worse, grew up with like a lot of spoiled kids, mm. right? That like they had a different I, a different upbringing as far as like, you know, the merit of your actions and things like that. But my parents did a very good job of always instilling in me um, that you're going to earn everything that you get in this life, good, bad, or, or, or otherwise. And so uh, I grew up as an athlete. I boxed and played hockey my entire life. So um, I didn't have a normal upbringing as far as the social circles of just like nothing to do but party on the weekends and get into trouble and all that kind of stuff. I, I played high-level sports um, and was usually traveling. Um, and so that just it gave me – a lot of uh, it instilled in me discipline and a routine and a way of doing things. I've always had a way of doing things because I, I had to be, you know, on a schedule and, and and at practice or training or doing whatever. And so I didn't get into a lot of the normal stuff that high school kids and everything did uh, back then. But I, I you know, I've, I've worked since I was 16 years old, full time, basically. Um, and then, you know, when I got to college, um, you know, I got out of high school. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I was one of those guys that like, I, I took my sports very, very, very seriously. Uh, I didn't take school that seriously. Mm. And I think that's like true of a lot of entrepreneurs. Like what they find meaning in is very important to them. Like sports were the most meaningful thing in the world to me when I was younger, hockey and boxing. I didn't, I hated the, the feeling of losing a fight is about the lowest you can feel as a human being, I feel like, right? That I've actually physically experienced. Like, they say that, you know, everybody, the, the worst day of your life is the worst day of your life, no matter who you are. Like, the worst days of my life were the day after I lost a fight. And that was very motivating to me. Uh, failing a math test didn't matter to me at all. I didn't really care. Um, but I was fortunate enough to have been blessed with some sort of ability and cognitive ability that I always tested really well. So I had really phenomenal SAT scores, got automatic acceptance to uh, a few different universities, decided on the University of Oklahoma, went there. My father and parents, who are real estate investors as well, owned a house in Oklahoma where my brother lived and also went to Oklahoma, which meant that I didn't have to live in the dorms when I went to college like most regular freshmen do because I had a house and and, uh, I had... We'd had the house long enough that I got in-state tuition and got to live at the house. Nice. Looking back, that was uh, there were definitely pros and cons. The, the pros were like, yeah, you didn't have to pay for room and board at school. I got to live in a nice house. It was it was really cool. I made a lot of friends. Uh, the cons were all those friends were three and four years older than me. They're all my brother's friends, all people that played on the hockey team at, in, in college. And so, you know, I was this 18-year-old kid hanging out with a bunch of 22-year-olds that were just partying their asses off, like hockey players, too. They really weren't at OU to go to school. They were there to play hockey. Yeah. And so uh, that was my first experience with, like, you know, you you get to, like, having that type of influence. And so uh, I, I was politely asked after the first year to not return 
to Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, who asked you? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, whoever was, signed that letter they sent me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what was your first job when you were 16? Hobby Lobby. Really? What were you yeah. doing there? Uh, cleaning Hobby Lobby. That's really? the only job they give 16-year-olds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I did everything. So Hobby Lobby was my first job. Wait, wait, uh, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. 16-year-old hockey player, boxer. Mm-hmm. And you're applying at Hobby Lobby. I was, I was, I got a referral. I knew somebody that worked oh, there, no. and then I got in, and it was close yeah. to my house. You needed the connection. So you had to hook exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 You got to know somebody to be able to sweep the floors with one of those long mops yeah. at Hobby Lobby. <laughs> so I did that for a while, and uh, I could not stand. And to this day, I don't know what it is. It's like the smell of fake flowers or something. That craft store smell gets to you. They all smell the same. Yep. I did not like that smell at all. I actually really enjoyed the people at Hobby Lobby. They're super nice. They're like a really good Christian organization. Everybody there is super sweet. I just couldn't do that that work and that smell. Uh, so I then I became a fry cook at a burger joint. Nice. Different smell. Different <laughs> smell. <laughs> yeah. That was a baller job because uh, it was just me and like six or seven of my friends from high school and... We just had so much fun. And I tell Nick, I mean, I talk about this all the time. Like, I truly believe that positivity and enjoying and finding joy in what you do is one of the most crucial variables to success in anything. And it's one of those intangibles that you can't put a KPI around. Yeah. Like, I loved working at the burger joint because my friends were there and we were having fun. But he also worked really hard. Like, a Sunday lunch rush at a packed burger joint is chaos don't mess those fries up bro, bro it's don't, so don't hard do it. it's such challenge like it's harder than what we do now it's so fast-paced it's so challenging the customers are 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 you know needy stuff's getting sent back we run out of stuff it's chaos for like eight straight hours but it's a blast do you have any old pictures that we can put up on the site? Oh, I guarantee you. With my, the hat? My dad have, was a, Did you have to wear the hat? Oh, he did wear hats. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. My dad's a big home movie guy. Is I, he? He's got volumes. I'm call Tom. Yeah, volumes. I'm, I'm of sliding into Tom's DMs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Send the fry pictures. Yes. <laughs> so I did that in high school. But I, I loved it, man. Yeah. I love that. Um, what's some of the th- what's one thing that you learned in that job that you still apply today? Uh, I think that like the, the the idea, you know, you call it, you know, however you want to, to word it like calm under pressure mm. like not allowing your emotions to run the show um cuz it's it can be chaos in a busy kitchen right and the people that would really screw things up are the people that get really frustrated and emotional when things aren't going well and that just turns into a spiral of even more negative stuff. When you're in a really negative mindset because you're already pissed off that you ran out of the right type of bun or whatever it is, and then you start making more mistakes, then you hold up the line, and now the line is off, right? And now burgers are coming out with no toppings, and like everything gets all messed up because you just got this thought in your head about this thing that you can't let go of, and now it's screwing everything else up behind it. So like yeah. the idea of like take every order as a new order. Right? Like every day is a new day. Every order is a new order. Every deal is a new deal, right? Like get out of that negativity about what just happened 20 minutes ago. The, the windshield's bigger than the rear view for a, you know, for a reason. That stuck with me because you had to. If you just like, you, you, there's a really good kitchen is like a dance. Everybody's like doing the dance together. Yeah. And, and you, you rely on your team members to, to be in it with you. And so that really stuck with me of like just... Eyes forward, keep moving, keep going, inch by inch. And so I really love that. Um, so, yeah, fast forward, left college, graduated from the University of North Texas. Had a great humbling experience getting, uh, uh, you know, going home after your, you know, combat veteran father has spent a fortune to send you to a great school and you have you know, kind of messed it up. It was a very mm. humbling experience. So I took things really seriously after that. Went to UNT, uh, graduated with great marks, got my creative writing degree where they didn't teach me how to spell. Uh, <laughs> you just needed to be th- creative, th- right? Thank you, yeah. thank you, UNT. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, really worked the only other job I've ever had in my life, and that was a bartender. Bartended all the way through, through school. Same thing as working in the kitchen. It's teamwork. It's fast-paced. It's a dance. Um Really, really, like I learned a ton. I did that for years. Loved it. Um, And then reality, like, showed itself. Graduated from college. 
And I remember graduating from college and then having to go to work that night after graduation and just this realization that like, I'm not in school anymore, Mm. but I'm working at a college bar and like, there's like a revelatory effect there where you're like, I'm going to work at the campus where I used to go to school, but like, I'm not officially a student there what's anymore. That, what's that one movie? Uh, where he's like, uh, old school? <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> the, um, what's the guy from Austin? Matthew McConaughey's in it. Oh, uh, Days and Confused. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. kind of what you feel like, yeah. right? And so I was like, I got to get a real job. And I hadn't really, up until that point, I really still wanted to write the great American novel. Um, you know, this is before AI could just pump out a book in 30 seconds. And so I kind of, you know, started to think really deeply about what I wanted to do with my life. I was 23 years old. I didn't really know. And what I did know is that I didn't like working for other people. Um, And I didn't know anybody who was really well off and really loved what they did that worked inside that was just kind of a cog in the system. I wanted to be a free thinker and I wanted to build things. Mm. And so, but in the, in the meantime, I needed to make money. So over the next couple of weeks, I did two things. I interviewed at a car dealership where my buddy worked. And then my brother, who was a real estate agent at the time, uh, hooked me up with a broker for Keller Williams to, to go meet with them. And I went on like back to back days and they told me I could make a lot more money selling real estate and selling cars kind of seemed like a beating. And so I, was like, okay. And I just decided to get my real estate license. <laughs> Started classes online the next day, finished in like a month, got my license. And uh, that was how I started the only career I've ever known. Um, how old were you when you got your license? 20. I was just turned 24. Gotcha. Yeah. And so I had no idea what I was getting into. Uh, like I think most real estate professionals don't actually truly know what they're getting into. I think people get into real estate for a lot of reasons. Um, Really, they don't know at the beginning how much work it is because they don't have the frame of mind of like, this is a business you're building. It's not just this thing where you go out and every all the deals come to you and you just go to happy hours and it's HGTV. It's not like like that. It's not like that. Really, at all. A lot of happy hours, though. There is a lot of happy hours. (laughs) Uh, They're not as important as agents would make you think. (laughs) But they are, there are a lot of happy hours. I didn't have any resources. I was still bartending at the time. I was doing both. So I'd bartend four days a week from 9 o'clock at night to about, I'd get home about 4 o'clock in the morning by the time we cleaned the bar and everything. Mm. Uh, and I did it for about eight months. I was still doing both. And in the, the meantime, I was 24, so none of my, really, my friends were buying homes or anything yet. And so, and I didn't really have a lot of money and I had no, no mindset for business yet. I didn't know how to run a P&L or anything like that. So I would wake up as early as I could after my bar shifts and I would go and I would door knock the old expired listings. Every day when you log into the MLS, it's got basically what's called the MLS hot sheet. It's everything that expired the day before is part of that. So whenever a, a, a listing doesn't sell, the contract with that agent that's listing it runs out. Those clients are basically fair game to sign with another realtor. And so there's all sorts of systems that we use on our teams now, Nick and I use, that we just cold call them or whatever. We get all their information and we just dial them. I didn't have any of that. Um, and I you had, didn't have any money. I didn't have any money to yeah. buy it. you yeah. know. And so I had a yellow legal pad where I'd write down all the addresses that uh, were within striking distance. And I would drive there. And if I talked to them, I'd write a note. If not, I'd circle it and I'd come back tomorrow. That was my entire system. And uh, that turned into... I was very blessed to sell, I think I sold 37 or 38 homes my first year. Wow. Um, yeah. Wow. And I, I was fortunate enough to be rookie of the year at the office that I'm still at today, uh, which was a blessing for sure. The thing was, you know, I didn't come, and I think this is really good for, for people that are real estate investors or agents or entrepreneurs in general, is like, I didn't come from a corporate background, so I didn't have any ideology of like, I should do this and get paid every two weeks. I never worked in an environment like that, really, at least not since, you know, Hobby Lobby and high school and stuff like that, right? Like, I was a bartender. You got paid in cash at the end of every night. If you worked, you made money. If you didn't, you didn't, right? And so that that idea of, you know, generating leads and getting deals done and the rejection that you face, like, 
I kind of expected that. I didn't really mind the rejection. I didn't mind having to grind it out. And I didn't ever have this, this mindset of like, I've done this and it's been two weeks. Where's my paycheck? I just kept doing it because that's what people told me to do. And frankly, like I lived for nothing really back then. I was still bartending and I could support myself that way. And so I had the latitude to just kind of do whatever I thought I needed to do until it was successful. And what happened was it really wasn't successful for like the first three or four months. Yeah. Nothing happened at all. Like nothing happened except me fumbling over my words and making a fool of myself when people actually opened the door. I had no idea what I was saying. I had no real service to provide. You know, nowadays I could sit down and I could say, here's everything that we're going to do. And here's our track record of success. And here's our 300 plus five star Google reviews and all that type of stuff. I didn't have any of that back then. Um, so I was just grinding it out. And I, I remember my first ever listing that I took. I remember this this day because I still sometimes call this guy during team meetings. Jesse knows this. Uh, I once call, called this guy during a team meeting just to live in the uh, energy for the group back up and be like, this is this is what you can accomplish. Uh, his name was Gary Harden. I don't know if I should say that on a podcast. Just, it's not a bad story. Anyway, I, I, a I, story. He, he was in McKinney and he was an expired and I knocked on his door and he actually answered. We had a great conversation. He was not ready to list again. I circled him on my legal pad and followed up with him 13 times. I would knock on, I knocked on his door for 13 straight days. It was like four <laughs> straight months. He would tell me like, come back next week, come back next week. We're not ready. We're taking a break. And so I would just come back and, and finally he let me in the house and, I think that just out of sheer perseverance, they gave me the listing because I really still didn't have much to say once I got in there, <laughs> except please, yeah, you know? And so uh, once that happened, it was like the floodgates opened. All of a sudden, things got a little easier because I had this positivity about it, right? Like I had seen this work now. You had the confidence behind it, right? Right. Yeah. And I had a pipeline of people that I was still doing the same thing with. So my conversations with them got better. And so... It just, the first half of the year, I really struggled. But then all of a sudden, it started to become way more natural. And it was still a grind. It was still a lot of work. Let's take the sales part off the table for just a second, because I love that part of the story. But I'm sitting here thinking about how does someone close, what, you said 37 or 38 yeah, deals so in your first year yeah. after getting off to a, a slow start or zero start for the first three or four months. So... You you build up these these this book of interested people. Mm -hmm. Clearly, you start signing listings, right? But I mean, I, I don't know how you balance how, like not knowing how to close deals and the process and all that stuff. How did you all of a sudden learn that stuff and be able to multitask and balance 37, 38 deals inside of eight months? Yeah, it's so that's a good question, and this is one of the things that I think we get really like tunnel vision about. We we don't see how the world happens for us around us all the time and how oppor opportunities lead to other opportunities. So I closed that many deals my first year, but not all of those were expired listings that I door knocked. What happened was when I got the first few listings under um, first, those first few listings and I closed them, um, <clears throat> I was way more involved in my business now. Like I was, I was working with title companies and you got to get deals closed and things like that. Like all of a sudden, like I was doing more of the actual business side of the work. And so one day I was sitting at one of my closings and I was talking with a woman who owned the title company who's actually now my sister's boss years later. It's crazy how small this world is. And um, she had just talked to a uh, broker out of Arizona who was working with a REIT who was looking to expand their buying into Texas. And she was like, I just happened to be there and we got to talking. And I, I can't remember how the conversation unfolded, but something piqued her interest of like, you should reach out to this guy. Um, Cause you know, what you're talking about and like your vision for your business might align really well. And so I just called him and I was like, Hey, like what, you know, tell me more about this, you know, what you guys are looking to do and expand all that type of stuff. Um, they were just buy like this is back when you can get three, two single story homes in, in the North Texas area for like $120,000, no problem. And they would cash flow off the MLS, right? I sold them like 22 of those homes that first year. And those were really simple because they were cash buyers. All I had to do was go and like take pictures, verify the condition of the home. They would pay cash. We'd close in 10 days. Really, really, really simple. Um, and so like maybe about half of my business came from my door knocking. The other half came from just being opportunistic and having a conversation 
actually following up from the conversation and taking the action. And then it turned into a real opportunity. And so my best month, my first year was like September or October. I had 10 closings. Wow. Yeah. And it was so funny because like back then I still had no systems. Like a whole system was I had a whiteboard in my apartment and I just wrote all the addresses and like where they were kind of at in the process uh, and everything. So it, it just kind of started to snowball. But at the end of the day, that's a system, right? Mm-hmm. And I think Nick and I would agree that you are the systems and process yes. guy for this Voltron mm-hmm. trifecta of ours, right? <laughs> and, and it's something you're really good at. So what I'm hearing so far, right, just kind of a quick summary. You, you start working early, right? You kind of take the non-glamorous job of sweeping up at Hobby Lobby, mm-hmm. right? Um, from now on, I'm going to bring you f- fake flowers. Oh, um, it's going to be fantastic. <laughs> then you take a service business job mm-hmm. or two service business jobs. One is the fry guy. Yep. I'm definitely reaching out to Tom about that one. And then bartender. And then yeah. you realize there's more for it. But, uh, and then you, you take this huge jump into real estate. And you, you're at the right place at the right time. You're persevering. You're door knocking. And, and the reason I want to I wanted kind of sur- summarize this for, the, for our listeners is because people don't, most of the time, people don't all of the, out of the blue become great, right? You got to put in the work. You got to you got to you got to take some of the hard knocks along the way. You got to do the unglamorous stuff, and and frankly, I always respect leaders more that have done the job that weren't just appointed into the job. Yeah. It's very easy to identify people. In corporate America, in business, in our business, right? That just kind of landed somewhere, yeah. Versus earned it and did the work and not door knocked and did the cold call pitches and and worked with title companies, so on and so forth. And when you, I think when you build a business organically, your leadership really shines and and the coaching that you're able to provide people becomes that much more real and authentic. I and. Every leader that I've I've worked, I should say of the leaders that I've worked for or with, the ones that have the experience and the hands-on are always the ones that yeah. stand out, yeah. right? Like 150%. Because even in real estate, which is a very entrepreneurial field, like there's still brokerages and large corporations and things like that. And there still is a lot of that bureauc- you know, bur- bureaucracy towards sure. the top. Yep. You yep. know what I mean? No. And the big thing that, and something that Matt just picked up on is, is you know, right place, right time. Which, you know, you hear that and you think, all right, well, I don't have that. I'm, I, I didn't. I don't have that opportunity. And something Mark Cuban talked about is is he believes, you know, when he sold that company for a billion dollars, he's yeah. like, yeah, th- that was a right. That was the timing, right? And there are things that are, are just timing, but you have to take advantage of a right for a right place, right time. You also have to walk through the door and take advantage of it. Yeah. And how many times, whether whether you're listening to this and want to become a business owner or an entrepreneur, or you want to get into an investing, and you just keep kicking the can down the road. Mm-hmm. And the difference between everybody on this is that they, they just they put blind faith and trust that it was going to all work out. You door knocked for three months. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I personally won't door knock. Yeah. Right? That's not something I would do. Um, I would fail in this business if that was all that, I, that would require me. But for you, you were like, all right, this is, I don't have any money. This is what I'm going to do. I door knocked. You had success. You then heard, you know, through connections and talking that, you know, this REIT was buying opportunities and you did the call, you did the follow up and then earn, you did the work to then start selling them and then continue to sell them. That's a relationship style. So that, that's massive. Yeah. Yeah. Thus, that is what led to this today. Agreed. And, yeah. And, and something Nick just said kind of, Sarah Blakely tells the story about how she started Spanx, right? And how she ended up in Neiman Marcus or Nordstrom, yeah. whatever, right? And she, she tells this part of the story where people are like, well, how did you get into Nordstrom? And she's like, I called them. <laughs> and apparently, like, the thing to do at that point was just go to all these trade shows and hope the right person walked by your booth and hope they stopped and hope that you could get into a, a more than 30-second introduction that's BS at the end of the day, right? She called him. She took the effort. And and my guess is that that wasn't the only time you showed up because you still got to play the averages. You can go to enough happy hours and strike out that are duds, you get a buzz, you go home, right? But there are, you show up to enough of those things and you show up to the right 
types of events and you have the right conversations and good things come out. And frankly, people like that don't take everybody seriously. So they look for people that are poised and well dressed and well spoken. So maybe, you know, good thing you were talking and not spelling. Not, right? not writing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so then so you get through first year, yeah. rookie of the year. <clears throat> You're door knocking, you're learning titles, you're already Mm -hmm. dealing with a REIT. Yeah. Then what? Then we get, you know, I got just an incredible first lesson in humility as an entrepreneur. Um, So I think to my own detriment, you know, up to that point, I never really thought much about how money works. I I grew up in a very conservative family. We didn't spend lavishly or anything like that, but I'd also never made a lot of money up until that point. I made. It was the first time I ever made six figures in my life, and the year before I made like $22,000 bartending or something like that, right? In cash, so, you know, don't tell anybody, but, you know, right? I think like, we're okay now. Yeah, yeah and, and my rent was like 400 bucks a month, you know? So, like, I, I, uh, I, w- I thought that was it. I was like, every year is going to be like this for the rest of my life, you know? And I never need to worry about money again. I just didn't, you know, I was young. I was still a kid, and... Um, so that second year is where I got a little fat and happy. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the same. I, I I do believe there is something to the the elite athlete who signs that mega contract, and then the next year they just aren't quite the same. Because you're like, I don't want to run this route over the middle and get lit up by a linebacker when I just signed an eighty million dollar contract. I just don't want to do that anymore. You know, and so I had some money. I decided rather than door knocking, I needed to, uh, you know, put some other systems in place. But I really liked getting my exercise still. And uh, I didn't. Uh, I, so I got my dialer. And so I'd call expired instead. But then I started like my marketing and my farming. And my farming strategy was this. Postage was still way too much for me. I didn't like to spend money on postage. So I had these neighborhoods in Frisco that every every month I would walk with my little satchel. I would print these newsletters out that I made myself and designed and wrote the articles and did all this stuff. And there was about 2,000 houses in these neighborhoods. And it would take me about a week, but I would just go and I'd put one and I'd knock on every door. And if they were there, I'd talk to them. And if not, then I'd just put it there. And so that was kind of like my next marketing strategy. But it took a long time. The thing about farming versus expired is that those people have already raised their hand and said they want to sell their home. When you're farming, it's much longer term. You can, you can farm a neighborhood for a year before anything really happens. I didn't really understand that at the time. And admittedly, my efforts with calling expireds and, and doing that, you know, when I had more money in the bank than I ever had before, it it just I wasn't as motivated. Mm. And I was also in a, a pretty 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 uh not great personal relationship at the time, which which wasn't a great influence on me. Um so I, I was spending more money than I would normally spend because uh, when you're not ar- you're already not super great with money because you've never really had any and you're 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 with somebody who's serious and and they're they're kind of the same way. You end up spending way more than you should, and and I was trying to keep up with the Joneses. I thought I was awesome. I you know I was wearing Zanga su- Zanga <laughs> suits everywhere and driving a Mercedes, and and um, that year ended with a divorce. And uh, about forty thousand dollars in credit card debt, and no no money left in the bank. <laughs> no, and so uh, you know, I had this amazing first year in real estate. You know, by the end of the next year, I was living in a tiny one bedroom apartment with a whole bunch of debt, and uh, kind of back to now. I don't have any. I can't really afford any systems again because I spent all my money, and uh, I had to get moving forward somehow, and so. That was a really, really great lesson because I've never, I've had a lot of ups and downs since then, like we always, like we all have. I've never hurt for money ever again. Mm. Um, because even in years where I haven't made as much money as the year before, I've adjusted my lifestyle dramatically to make sure that I never have to go to that place again. Right. You know, I've never even carried a credit card balance one single month since then. No kidding. Yeah, I just won't do it. Um, and so I joined a team at my office. And I think, you know, at that point, that was one of the best things I ever did in my career. Because it, it was the first thing that taught me how, to, how a business really should run. Rather than just being a real estate agent, 
I started to learn, for good and worse, what you should and should not be doing when you're actually running a business. And I, uh, I just started to focus only on the things that made me money. I figured out really, really quickly that a lot of the stuff that I was doing in my business was just stuff that needed to be done, but could be done by anybody and didn't need to be me. That team that I joined had very little leverage compared to what we have now, but it was enough for me to go, my job is to find new business every single day, and your job is to handle anything that I dump on you that is to do with existing business. Once I get that appointment, I get that deal signed, I'm throwing it on you in whatever fashion and form it comes in, and I will be there for emergencies, but this is your client now, and I just went out and I did that. And so I got back to my roots a little bit of just grinding out, just doing business. And uh, I think it did like 13 million in sales that year, like 46 transactions or something like that. Uh, and that was my best year ever. So it went from great year to terrible to great year again. And I learned a lot along the way. Um, and as that year kind of concluded, I started to get this, this mindset of like, I want... It was the first time in my life I, I really felt like I had something to give others. Like I had learned enough at that point, and I don't know that I ever really even felt this growing up or anything, but it definitely started to manifest in this moment was, was like, I want to give back. I want to coach, and I want to, I want to help elevate other people because I, I've been through a lot in this business in just a few short years. I've been through a lot of highs, a lot of lows, and you get this, this like tug to start to, to give back to people. And so I actually took a, a role – while I was still selling, I left that team and, and I was still selling on my own, but I took a role as a director of productivity at our, our office where I was, I was housed out of, which is a big flagship office of 700 something agents. And um, I did that for a year as well while I was still selling. And uh, then I, I learned really, really quickly that the idea was great, but the way that it was executed or the way that it showed up in my world was not what I was expecting. I was expecting that I would come into this role and have a whole bunch of young, eager agents ready to learn and go out and take massive action like I was, and we'd all be so excited every day, and we'd be freaking ready to go. And then I realized that most agents are not like I was when I started. <laughs> Like you, they're 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 the eighty seven percent that don't make it a year in this business. Um, and the thing about it is, you know, they're independent contractors, so they don't have to come to work every single day. And so my role, you know, the financials of that role was really dependent on on how how I was able to get them into production. But without any accountability whatsoever, it became a very frustrating role very very quickly. And no repercussions. No repercussions. No accountability for you. No accountability for them. For them. For them. Meaning okay. like. I was there every day. It was required of me to be there every day. I am here to help you grow your business. I'm here to take my experience and help guide you. And But whether they showed up and did anything or not was entirely up to them, and, and I couldn't fire anybody. A question for you. Uh, as the director of productivity, right, as you, and I think you and Nick both use this term all the time, as you pour into these people, mm-hmm. right, what do you think were some of the some of your strengths that you try to pass on to the people that you are trying to impact? Oh, uh, that's a really good question. I think that as a, a leader, even now, like I, I, I know what I try really hard at. Mm-hmm. I try really hard at finding what is meaningful to people and speaking to that in a way that we find, uh, you know, we find a mutual vision with, with our partnership, right? I don't believe that you get the best out of people when you decide what the goal should be for them. I think that you have to dive really deep with people to find what's incredibly meaningful to them and then find out how when they win, you win and we all win. And I, I think I've always been really, I should say, I, I've at least always tried really hard to, to relate with people on that deeper level. Um, and honestly, this isn't fancy, but no bullshit accountability. Yeah, I just don't accept a lot of excuses from people. You know, and I just, I, 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 I simply say that just because, like, we live in such a privileged society here that I don't really, 
I don't take kindly to people just not doing shit and then making excuses about why they couldn't do it. It's like the butts and becauses that it's the butts and becauses right? that Brian Mayoral was talking about. A hundred percent. You know, it's there are so many areas of this world where it's difficult to even get by on a day to day basis, and that is really not true for most of us here. Yeah. We're so fortunate to even have the opportunity to wake up and get moving forward every day. If we're not taking that opportunity, I've always. I feel that one of my strengths has always been not accepting that we're just not going to do what we said we were going to do today. Um, so that that no bullshit accountability, but I think you only earn that ability to be that honest with people when you can relate to them on a deeper level and when you find what's important to them. I think one of the things that I've done, you know, while I, I have so much to learn as a leader and that journey will never end, the learning journey will never end, I think one of the things that I've done at least remotely well, is I can tell you not just the financial goals, but the personal vision for every one of my people. I have those memorized. What's important to them, whether it's, you know, the family they want to start, the, 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 like what they want to do to make, you know, certain relationships in their life a different way. Like it's, it's, you know, I know about their upbringings, why certain things are important to them. It's very, very important to me to understand why people's goals are important to them more than just what their goals are. Mm. Uh, and I think that earns you a different level of accountability with people because you're not just speaking to the goals they wrote on some sheet of paper. You're speaking to the vision that they have for their lives. And we all need accountable. Uh, we all need accountability from others around the vision that we have for our own lives. That's what keeps us, you know honest every day about what we're doing yeah and i think that that level of accountability is what separates people that actually achieve things versus people that have the victim mentality 100 percent, right i mean everybody's gonna have a bad day but try not to turn in, into the world is against me type stuff or i couldn't succeed because of x y and z when you hold yourself accountable and you're willing to do whatever it takes to get there legally of course right <laughs> um you know it, you you separate yourself from the pack there's there's people that put in the effort, and there's people that talk about it. Yeah. Well, it's the grit side of things, right? So if you go in here, and then, I mean, we're 41 minutes in, so I want to I want you to speed up a portion yeah, sorry. of this. That's all right. <laughs> That's the creative side of you. Yeah. Um, but if you kind of listen already to the to the history of of your your work, and even just in college career, it is highs and lows, highs and lows. Mm. But at the same time, there's perseverance. It's that grit of, of mm. you know, there's a lot of people that may would have quit college. You know, you're mm. like, uh, I got to go to UNT. UNT is <laughs> a great school, by the it way. Is. But you came from OU, you yeah. know, University of Oklahoma. Mm. You know, you were asked to leave and, and that could have, you know, that could have, you know, messed you up a little bit. Mm. Um, you know, you, your, your friends, you made friends up there and then now you have to go do it all over again at, at UNT. And then you graduate and you get into real estate. You have a great year and the next year, divorce and, and, and not so great. Yeah. And then, you know, so that ups and down can be really challenging. Yeah. But, but the grit of per, you know, pressing forward, and then even as you left the the director of productivity, then you went into to building a, re, a very successful real estate team. Yeah. And, you know, which which you know, if you want to talk about great, but I I want to hear more about your investing journey. Yeah, hundred percent. Right? And and since this is the more doors, it, it is. Yeah, and and, and I, I I love. I don't know. I, I usually never talk about my stories, so maybe this has all just been pent up. So I'm rambling. That's, on yeah, that's cool. Bit. That's great. Uh, that's cool. So we'll fast fast forward just on on that journey, then we'll get to the investing. The, the one thing you talk about highs and lows. So Nick knows this uh, about me. So when when I left that director of productivity job, I decided I'm gonna you know go back out on my own. I'm gonna start a team, and I'm gonna really treat it like a business this time, right? Um, but I've always been very frugal in how we spend money in our business. So I, I didn't want to do anything like pay for office space or anything like that. So the running joke, we had a building that was over on this side of the parking lot before, and uh, I didn't want to pay for office space. Nick had this massive team in this massive office, um, and there was this little room in the building that was for everybody. It was like a quiet calling room. Like you could just go in and make calls in there, and it's supposed to be for everybody. But I realized if I just got there, did early, you jam your whole team in that? Little I just realized. <laughs> I just realized if I got there early enough in the morning, nobody wanted to come in there with us because we were all making calls and two pe people were too, you know, scared. I, heard, I, think to come I heard in. about this room. Seven thirty every day, I would have to be at the office in that in that room, and I did that for a year and a half. And they we, gave it to them eventually. They just people stopped coming in there, and so I kind of just 
squatted in that office and took it. Uh, anyway, yes. So that was kind of the start of really running in the business like a business. There were still many, many highs and lows, good years, bad years, a lot of highs, a lot of tears and things like that. But we, we took that and built that into to one of the top 100 real estate teams in America uh, in 2022. So that was really awesome. In the meantime, I always had an eye for how do I transition what I'm doing as an entrepreneur into a real wealth building journey. And multifamily real estate was the thing that I wanted to get into since back in the door knocking days. I read Joe Fairless's best ever apartment syndication book when it came out in like 2014, I think, something like that. I was like two years into the real estate business. I still, that was like my down year. I didn't have like a dime to my name at that point really. And I was like, I need to be prepared. I've always had this mindset like I I have my highs, I have my lows. I I don't like not every day is a good day just like any other human, but I've been very insistent that I'm going to accomplish my vision eventually and I need to be prepared for that. The only way to accomplish my vision for for the life that I want to build is to know what I'm doing and that starts way before you're qualified to do it. So I started l- learning about multifamily investing nine years before I ever made my first LP investment. No, seven years, something like that, right? I didn't know what I was doing, but I knew that if I started to learn how to do it, then when the opportunity showed up, then I would be in a position to take advantage of it. Of all the things you could have invested in, like why was multifamily exciting for you? For the same reasons that, that it's exciting to me now. And I wish it was more complicated. Diversification, cash flow per door, tax advantages, all the stuff that weren't really relevant to me back then because I couldn't really make the investments. But I knew when I started making a lot of money off my real estate business, I needed to make sure that I had a way to put that into tangible assets that cash flowed, that I could take advantage of the tax considerations, and that were were um, you know the long term appreciation was very solid and diversified um, economies of scale, not building it one door at a time like we do with single family. Like I still invest in single family, but I don't chase down one door at a time to build a rental portfolio. Mm-hmm. I was I, I had learned enough before I ever even became an investor that I knew I didn't want to go that route. And I think this also comes from never working in the corporate world. I've never felt like things were in my upbringing, my parents always instilled this in me. Like, I never thought things were too big to achieve. So I just assumed that even though I was $40,000 in credit card debt, when I started making money again, I was going to make the jump right into multifamily. I didn't want to do single family. And even though it sounded like it was a million miles away, I wanted to learn everything that I could about it. Mm. And, uh, you know, being a writing major, I've always been a big reader. And so I just read everything I possibly could. So when the time came to actually make my first investment, I think I had a pretty good idea of how to vet a sponsor. I followed so many people in in their journey that when I finally wrote that first $50,000 check years later, I had a lot of confidence in what I was doing. It was everything that I had read was coming to fruition in a way that I was able to kind of vet the sponsor, vet the deal, understand what I was doing, and pull the trigger. And that took away some of the you know, that, that thing that keeps so many people from investing, which is just like the time you click that button to send that wire is the scariest moment of your life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> yes. So let me, let, let me ask you a, a catalytic question. Ooh. So there's a lot of folks, you like that? The that's first an, a, was that's an AI word. Yeah. There you go. Yep. So I think there's a lot of folks out there that really want to do something. Yeah. Right. And they read and they go to seminars and they join coaching programs. And they never take any action. Mm-hmm. You said before, when you knew you were ready, yeah, right. So what changed? What was what was the accelerant? What was the catalyst for you to say, okay, I've done all this studying and I've all all this preparation. Now it's time for action. Yeah, for me, I knew when I was ready because I knew that this was 
quite frankly, this is just the God's honest answer. I knew that if the money that I was signing away right now never came back to me, that I was still going to be okay. Mm. And and as an entrepreneur, it can take you a little while to get there because your your income is not always stable. If I was working a W-2 job with a high income, I probably would have gotten there a lot faster because I know, look, as long as I don't get fired, you know, this money can disappear and it's going to suck, but I'm getting that paycheck every single two weeks, right? So I, I really needed to learn uh, and continue to grow my business and my 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 consistent income, just so that I knew. Look, I'm not putting everything on the line here because I don't have a W two. I have a business, and businesses can rise and fall. I need to get to a point where when I sign this money away, even if it never comes back to me, I'm gonna be okay with that because I know that if I get to that point mentally, and the worst thing, my worst fear becomes realized, and and I don't get that money back, or it doesn't, you know, we don't hit the returns that we're supposed to. It's not going to make me gun shy from doing it again. If I lost everything in that first deal, I would be way too gun shy to ever invest in anything again. So I had to get to that point mentally where I knew that things were going to be okay because I'd built a stable enough business that that it didn't, you know, it, it wasn't going to sink me. So you eliminated the objection. We talked about this mm-hmm. a couple weeks ago, right? We you eliminated the objection of the worst case scenario. Right. If the worst case scenario happens, you're not going to be out on a corner with a tin cup yeah. and a German shepherd. Yes, right. And and the worst case scenario. I had to be realistic about it. The worst case scenario is losing $50,000. The worst case scenario is not losing $50,000, all my friends, my wife, my business, and a meteor hitting my house, right? Like, but we build those things up, you know yeah. what I mean? And that, that keeps us from pulling the trigger a lot. Gotcha. So you make an LP investment seven years in, yeah. right? Or seven years after you read Joe Fairless's book. Mm-hmm. Uh, then what? Like, and then how did, you, how did you get here? Yeah. So then did three more, and so just got really used to it. The thing... And I, and I did a bunch of other stuff along the way. I started flipping houses, um, all that type of stuff. I learned a lot of the things that I liked doing and I didn't like doing. Uh, I, bought a, I bought short-term rentals. Don't like doing that. Uh, I still own those. They're kind of a pain in the ass. Uh, I still flip houses. I like doing that. I don't think it's the only thing that I would ever want to do because it's just a, it's, it's a very time-intensive business. Um, but I still was like... No matter how many LP investments I made, no matter how many single family houses I flipped or bought or whatever, I was like, every time I drive past a big class A apartment complex, I was like, I want to fucking own one. <laughs> so bad, dude. And just when you get used to writing that check and seeing the returns and you get that money every month, you're like, this is so possible. And then because I had invested and because I had built a business and because I had a network, it was a relatively organic transition because... I, I knew other accredited investors. They knew me as a real estate professional and a successful and seasoned investor. And so when it came time to start raising capital, I felt much more comfortable about it. So by pure opportunistic happenstance, right, I had built a business. I had gone through the highs and the lows and everything in my career. And one of the amazing sales agents on my team started dating this big bear of a man <laughs> named Matt Pachowski, <laughs> whom I had dinner with. And fell in love with him. Mm. And so he was a multifamily investor. And he'd actually done what I wanted to do. And Nick had done what I wanted to do. Nick had been one of my best friends for a decade at this point. He was, he, I mean, we, we were always in the same building and stuff. And, and I invested in he one would of never his deals. Leave. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he would. He would just wouldn't go away. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Did you go to the Did you go to the bar that he used to work at? No. Be honest. No, no, because that was in Denton. Wasn't yeah, it, that, was, that, was, that was that was way definitely up not in. driving up there. Yeah, you do that plenty now. Is. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ironically, now that's ironically where most yeah, of my yeah, exactly. Are. Yes, those are those are divey, divey, divey bars. Um, and so we got to you know we formed a relationship and we all. I mean, we, I real. I mean, I already knew Nick very, very, very well. And then I, I met you and, and we hit it off and I knew that you were just another doer, a man of action. Right. And it was amazing. We, we called each other and we decided to go have breakfast together and that was October. And by November we had our first executed LOI. And it, it was that quick, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. It was just one of those things where you, if you get people together that are just hell bent on doing something, it's pretty amazing how you get shit done. Yeah. It would, and and that's for as much as I talk, you know, when I get on my tangents, I get really fucking tired of people that only talk. Yeah. You know, and so it was incredibly refreshing to see somebody that had actually done on some level what I was trying to do because I'd already invested in other people's deals. I'd gotten over that hump. 
I'd done flips. I'd even lost money on flips at that time, and it didn't kill me. You know, I'd been through enough of the bad shit that I was still ready to move forward. And doing that first deal together, it's just it's it's made me even so much more committed to what we're doing. Because I was telling Nick the other day, I was like, you know, I know that there's you know the asset management side and learning all that and and getting things stabilized. You know, it's a lot of work. Flipping house is a lot of work too. Running a team of 35 agents is a hell of a lot of work, right? Like everything we do is is work. I would say that now that I'm in it as a GP, I think that this is about, you know, pound for pound, the most meaningful work that we can do for our financial futures because I work a lot on our single family business. I work a lot on the investment business. I work a lot for our property management company. And those are fantastic businesses. I love them. But we get so intimidated with large apartment complexes, like we couldn't handle it. It's the same amount of work, dude. Mm. It's you, the same thing. If you break down, like Matt, if you if you kind of break down what he said earlier, right? Director of productivity. He's like, man, I thought this was going to go great. Yeah. What he realized was that the agents there, the unfortunately, the average, they're just not going to take action, right? And that's very frustrating, right? So you get frustrated at that, and that that had a that can impact positively or negatively your income that you make. So moving into a GP role, what you get to do is like, yes, it's it's a way to help control your financial wealthy uh, well-being, but at the same time, the, the LP investors that take advantage of this, this is someone that now Brian, myself, and you, we can have a positive impact on them um, without having like, you know, the 1099 contractors, like if you do this, this, mm. this will change your life. Yeah. All you have to do, here is put your put your 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 faith and trust that these three sitting at this table can when when shit hits the fan they know how to mm-hmm. to to step up and correct a problem or they know how to efficiently and effectively run a business mm-hmm. right and then at the end of it in 3 to 5 years the return on capital is there and then either you parlay that into more whatever that may be so you now have a more direct influence yep. over helping other people increase their wealth yep. Or the return on investment, or saving in taxes. Yeah. So now you get to control that. Hundred percent. Something else I really want to double tap into is, and I want we've talked about this before, and I, I meant to make a, a, I meant to make this statement before we kind of got into the the meat and potatoes of this. We talk a lot, and we have a lot of people talk to us about the importance of picking the jockey over the horse, mm-hmm. right? Sponsor first, then deal. And I want all of our listeners to realize that Brian's very, very three-dimensional, and I think this is what really makes him an asset to the team and to our investors and creates an amazing vision for the future. Here's a guy that did the grunt work as a teenager, right? Did you know? Knows the importance of, of being in a service business, Um Start off door knocking, so you're in the Texas heat, knocking on doors, which ain't fun, Mm -mm. right? (coughs) Built up your business, went through the highs and lows, but now you've seen firsthand how to build a team. You're the systems and process guru for our business. You know the flipping side. You know what it's like to deal with vendors, negotiate, hold people accountable. You and Nick own a residential property management business, so you've seen the property management side. There is plenty of people that go to seminars and join masterminds and stuff, and all they know is the underwriting spreadsheet, right? This is, I learned, I was taught to put 7% economic vacancy. I was taught to put 2% loss to lease, and here are all my assumptions. The difference, though, is the execution. How do you hold your team accountable for delivering that plan? And frankly, do you have the experience to make that plan come to life? And one of the things I really appreciate about working with you and Nick on is when it comes down to a property management issue, right? You guys have seen it. You've solved it. You know a guy. You know somebody. The whole thing. And like when we run into a headwind or 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 an issue, like you guys are on it. And I think that's that's one of the things that is critically important for building a hyper successful team is having people that know 
the details and know what it takes to make a business successful. Yeah, and I, and I appreciate that. And same, you know, obviously with Nick being in, in the exact same business for, for so long and us running successful businesses together, you know, as well. I think our property management company is a really good testament to that because you know, I know Nick feels the same way. I consider myself an opportunist. If I think that something is possible, I don't see any reason not to go after it. And one, because life's too short, but also I just, I try not to take things too seriously to, to get in my own way. Mm-hmm. You know, the idea of failing at something is, is never been a deterrent for me. Um, now, taking responsibility for execution, absolutely, right? But not, you know, the, the property management company came about because there was a massive opportunity there. We had the right network for it. We had the right audience. I think it checked all the boxes as far as our skill set. We just never run a property management company before. When we had the right person. And so we found the right person. Yeah. Right. And Who so, not how, right? Who we, not how? Yeah, exactly. Right? And even that person, so we just started to combine the elements. We had the right talent, and then we, and we had the right audience, and then we just needed the right systems. And the talent that we had had never done something on the scale that we're at now. And so the system started very small, very basic, taking what was in her head and creating a business around it. And now all of a sudden when you do that and you find the right people and you execute and, or you access your audience, it's incredible what can happen. you know. But we had to go into that knowing we were going to screw up a lot of shit up in the beginning along yeah. the way, right? And and you want to minimize any, like you want to take responsibility, minimize any anything that 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 affects anybody else. Like, of course, be very responsible around your business. I think so many people don't th- do things. They don't get started because they're afraid of crashing the car. That's the big. I was going to say you talked about the execution. They went to a seminar. They they fill it out. They can tell you anything about underwriting because of what that person. They can regurgitate. Mm. And then you ask them why they haven't done it, and the answer is they just they're fearful, mm. right? One thing about Brian, I will say, Brian is the positivity in this group, right? He is the the ray of sunshine when when I'm probably the real dark clouds. Matt's just kind of sun sometimes pokes through, then it's raining, <laughs> then it pokes through. And we'll get that on the GP right. uh, spotlight on, on on Matt here next time, but Brian is like, hey. You got an idea? Let's go run with it. Let's we we can do this, right? You know, we, we build badass businesses. We could do this. This is easy. And then he, then all of a sudden we're in the business. And we're like, okay, here we are. Yeah. And we've got business coming in. Yeah. And so it's just the the maybe it's you just don't know the fear is there, and you're like, all right, we're just moving forward because the fear never showed up, or you don't know what that feeling is, yeah. and you're like, screw it. I've been through the highs, they've been through the lows, and as long as we do this, it works out. Yeah. And, and so, you know, that's just something that you've, you've done at a high, high level. I appreciate that. And I, I think that's if actual advice I could ever give to anybody listening is like your worst fear that you have around whatever the thing is that you're not doing, you're magnifying that fear by 10 times. I've been through the dark shit and the stuff that doesn't work and the loss of money and the things that fall apart. And, and you're still here. You're still here. And yeah. honestly, it makes you more positive because the things like that's so lame to say, like what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, it does reinforce the idea that you can survive just about anything with a positive mindset. Agreed. You know, Agreed. and so I think that I, I like to think that I'm living proof of that. Absolutely. Um, before we before we start moving towards wrapping up, I did. I want to drill down a little bit on on why we call you our systems and process guy. And I think that's. That's one of your innate talents, something you're proud of, and frankly, something we're very proud of you for, yeah. and something that you're really, really good at. So give, give our listeners an idea about the types of systems and processes that you've run and, and how you, what, what you do inside of Deep Blue to kind of keep the, keep the machine moving. Yeah, 100%. So you know, I, in, in our real estate businesses, I've always had a philosophy as a leader that everybody's job should be able to be articulated in one sentence or less. And so I'll give you an example, right? Like our listing manager for our residential sales team. If you ask a listing manager what their job is, they're like, well, I get the listings on the market. I, my listing manager's job is I need to make sure that every single one of our sellers gives us a five-star review on Google. I don't care how it happens, but that's your job. My job has always been to answer the question, what happens next? And so in every aspect of our business, Deep Blue especially, The way that I build systems is by taking the core of what needs to happen in the business, starting at the top 
and going what happens next, right? So when we started Deep Blue, these businesses only have so many components. You have the sponsors, GPs, the owners, the founders of the business. You have investment partners who are entrusting them with their with their money and their their wealth building. You have assets which you are purchasing. You have the management of those assets and how that that happens, right? And then you have all the kind of interconnected pieces in between. And so you start to imagine how does all these how do all these things revolve around one another and then what happens next, right? And so even at the outset of of Deep Blue, it was what happens next? We have to build the brand. We have to build a forward-facing presence. We have to build a, a funnel and a machine by which to grow our audience, have better conversations with our audience, uh, get deeper relationships. We have to have lead generation. We have to have underwriting processes. We have to have accountability around where every single deal is at in the process. We have to have our, our, our systems around how we take uh, a deal from A to B and get it from you know escrow to closing. We have to have a a process for how we get an investor from they've heard about our brand to have they, they've had a conversation with us to they've you know they filled out an investor profile and now we know more about them and their goals and their future. And I, I tend to spend a lot of time whiteboarding out how to get from A to B in every single one of those aspects of the business. And I'll literally write out, this is kind of like my little trademark, I'll write out where we start and where we end and draw it out. And every line that I don't have a step for, I'll just write there what happens next. And it might take a little while. I'd never built a company like this before, but I knew what the core pieces needed to be. And so I spent a lot of time for Deep Blue just whiteboarding and drawing the line what happens next. And then I would just go into research mode. What is the best solution to get from this part to this part, to this part, to this part? And now, you know, if you sign up, People don't see this in the background, but let's just say you go to deepbluere.com and you know you fill out your investor profile. There's like 19 different things that happen in the background to make sure um, that you're able to get more familiar with our brand, that we're get able to get more familiar with you as an investor, and continue to deepen our relationship. And those things along the way just come with a lot of asking the question, what happens next, and then being committed to finding a solution at every step. And then there's the technical part, which is understanding how softwares and things like that work. But... <laughs> It's a lot of deep thought and a lot of asking the question, what happens next? Love that. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. What happens next now, Brian? Whew. I think I probably stopped talking is what happens next. We might have I've to taken have a us part, over. Part two of this show. Part two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what happens next, boys, is is we've we've proved the concept here at Deep Blue. And in, and I think that one thing to maybe leave our audience with is that of not just me, I know this, this this spotlight was on me today, but every single person at this table has been through similar highs and lows and persevered. And I think that the testament to how many different parallel businesses we've succeeded at is is a testament to not only our commitment to excellence, but our, our ability to think spatially, put pieces together, um, and drive success in whatever we do. I just don't think you're going to scare anybody at this table into quitting anything. And, um, you know, Nick has been living proof of that as well. And in our last GP spotlight and, and Matt certainly is as well. So I, I think that even though deep blue is not the only business we run, I think the, um, you know, what we've been able to show in different aspects of our lives and businesses is a testament to the kind of people sit at this table. It's fight or flight. Yeah, absolutely. Every single day. And I don't like to fly. Yeah. The, you know, the, <laughs> other, the other thing, too, is, is uh, so I'm a big fan of Joe DeSena, right? The guy who, who built Spartan. Yeah. And I used to listen to their podcast a lot. And, uh, you know, he was always a big fan of hiring wrestlers, right? And the reason is because at the end of the at the end of the match, a wrestler can only point at their own self for their success or failure. And as you described yourself before as a boxer, boxers definitely fall into the whole yeah. that category too, mm -hmm. right? And and uh, you know I think you have a, a a whole lot of grittiness about you, which we which we both really appreciate. But you're definitely that guy at the end of the day that owns his successes and 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 shortcomings. And so I, I really appreciate about that about you. Thank you, brother. I yeah. appreciate you guys as well and everything that you bring to this well, partnership. We didn't say we appreciate you. <laughs> yeah, we're, just com yeah, we're complimenting that yeah. part. I'm going to take it as a compliment. <laughs> you should. Man. You should. Don't let Nick rain on your parade. <laughs> <laughs> on the dark cloud. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. in, the, in the black hoodie. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> well, this was good. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Real fun. Brian Force, GP Profile. Thank you, boys. Yeah. We'll do it again. 
we'll couple do it weeks. soon. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. We got. I think we got the next three or four weeks already set up. So, okay. Uh, I'll be in the hot seat next month. You'll I promise. Time to think. Next month. Yeah. Right, we've got some yeah. fun. Like, well, we, the ideas we have coming. I, I'm excited. Yeah. About yeah, yeah. Absolutely. A couple in particular, I'm pretty excited. Yeah. About. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. So <laughs> that we got them to agree. Yes. This is a huge. The the, the next couple guests we have that will start coming on. I can't even believe that we were able to sign them to a contract to come on. Right. A yeah. massive opportunity, massive deal. We for have the our show. first billion dollar in AUM guest coming up in yeah, the next couple of weeks. Yeah, that'll yep. be a blast. Yes. Billion with a B. Yeah. You know what's so funny? And I didn't think about this until we started doing this is because uh, Nick and I, we, you know, we'd done the other podcast with Jesse for a long time. Like the first thing in the Joe Fairless book that I read 2014 was like, become a thought leader and start a podcast. Even if you're not quite sure, just have guests on the show. And I was like, that's what we fucking do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all, see, it all comes to fruition. Right. It, just, it. it just took, uh, what, 16, what is that, 16 years, 10 years? Something 10 like years. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, all right, Nick, take us home. Man, that was a great episode. Uh, go back and listen to the last ones. Like, just go consume it, right? You know, if you're if if you're like me, I like to work out and and get on that stairmaster and just listen to podcasts because it makes it go by. Especially uh, the the entertaining ones like these, um, and and you know, especially Brian's. I would definitely do anything I can to follow what Brian is doing. So just reach out to him. Um, and you can do that by going to deepblue.re.com. Sign up for that newsletter because there's 19 things of what's next, what's next, what's next. And you're going to find out once you sign up what next is. And if you're interested in learning about becoming an, an, a, an investor with us, right, we would love the opportunity to talk with you. Uh, we'd love the right to become a partner with you to in, to invest in some projects. We've got some great deals in the pipeline that are coming out. Um, and the one that we just had, our first one, is going really, really well, yeah. um, especially during a time when others aren't. Yeah. I mean, you know, mm-hmm. we're hearing some bad, bad stories. Mm-hmm. And so that comes down to, again, the operators. It comes down to the team that we have. So um, we're really thankful and grateful for the investors we have. And, and hopefully that could be you in the future. So deepbluere.com. And if you want to be a thought leader, like Brian said, Joe Fairless said it, become a thought leader. Um, you need to start a podcast. So you need to get with it. Jesse over at Tor Studios, T-O-R-E studios.com. Um, and just uh, reach out to him. Uh, you don't have to come in studio. He can do it all virtually. Mm. He knows how to do it. He knows how to make you look good and sound good. Um, and that's just taking action is the first step. Look what, if Brian can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yes. So, um, and then uh, just subscribe. YouTube. Smash that subscribe button. Smash it real hard. <laughs> and then uh, just go on LinkedIn and uh, find all of us. You know our names by now. And then um, leave us a five star review, please. Yes, please. Yep. And then, I'll, uh, I'll read those. Don't worry, Nick. Yes. You def- <laughs> yeah, definitely. I only read the one stars. He'll read the five stars. Yeah. So uh, we haven't gotten any one stars. Just no, to clarify, absolutely not. Yeah. So uh, we'll see you on the next show. Jesse, get us out of here. Thank you, boys. Thanks, everybody. Bye.